Hello. <laughs> hello. Hmm. Hello, hello. Hello, everybody. Hmm. Mm. I hope you're all doing well. Mm. We might take the time to see the other yogis, other page. Mm. Huh. Good to see you. <clears throat> the other day I was looking at uh, this whole area of coconut trees with the long trunk and um, they were all leaning, really leaning toward the sun. You know, they had grown in a, an area that seemed sunny enough to me, but they were leaning toward the sun and it uh, just kind of uh, reminded me of how, because we have the six cent stores and we tend to be leaning toward sights and sounds and smells and tastes and touches and uh, other people's thoughts, emotions. Um, you know, there's that leaning, leaning toward, and that the the grace and gift of the practice is really being able to just come back um, deep inside at times, of course, at times. Uh, so I think that of course, of course we lean toward the sun. Yeah, it's, there's nothing wrong with it. But I think also that taking the time to find that inside uh, is also so um, important and fortunate that we get to practice that. So one kind of <clears throat> invitation that we can experience with that shifting from leaning outward uh, is, of course, to make an intention to be kind with whatever is appearing during the meditation right now. Caring about pain, appreciating joy, just just finding that often that it can be very simple. Just the word kindness can kind of relax the heart. We We don't necessarily have to kind of make that intention over and over, but it is helpful at the beginning of the sitting to remind ourselves of its importance and how it softens the heart and mind to be with things as they are. And you might Take a little time to receive it, receive that intention to be kind. A lot of the practice is seeing how much of a hurry we're in and shifting back again, shifting back inward to a timelessness.
And sometimes it's helpful to let the attention open up to a very wide <clears throat> field of awareness. So that when we become aware of hearing, it's more like listening to music or an orchestra. So we're just letting sounds come to our attention. as best we can with some ease. So it's just a uh, hearing. We're just aware of hearing. And we might feel some kindness at our ear doors, ear door, ear doors. our care. And as that softening and relaxation happens, you see if you can receive the sound directly, sounds directly right within the ear door, at times not through the thought process. And of course, <laughs> thoughts about the sounds will happen. So you're not trying to stop thinking from happening, but you just notice that conceptual overlay that has appeared and disappeared. And you shift back to seeing if you can receive the sounds just as they are, textures, vibrations changing moment by moment. And often with sound, we can understand a little bit more clearly that the sounds are not referring back to an I or a me or a mine. We feel that ease of not having to control them. It's that allowing receptive attention that can just be connected with them, but not controlling. And of course, you can stay with this practice with the hearing longer. And if you want to see just a shifting with the awareness around and inside our hands, There's the thought, the word hand, or my hands. And it's the same process, the same practice of receiving the textures and vibrations directly, not through the thought process of my hand or, or the visual image of the hands at times. The image will come and go. No problem. No struggle.
And again, there's this ease that can come from just allowing these sensations, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, to come and go just as they are. Allowing this aliveness of being. And settling the attention, if we can, around where the movement of the breath is happening at our abdomen or inside. If you can, without forcing the attention. But it's like listening. It's just like listening to music. It's like listening for these sensations. Just as they're appearing with the rising movement, taking birth. Living themselves out. And passing away. And if it's hard to be with those movements within the breath, Sometimes it's helpful to just put our hand right on the abdomen or belly. You don't have to try so hard. You just let the movement come into the hand. Or you keep your attention in the hand and notice the movement from a distance. No problem. Whatever appears, thoughts, emotions, happiness, care, fear, anger. It's just like being with the breath, body sensations, sounds. Connecting, no need to get anything or get rid of anything. This music of aliveness. Not me, not I, not mine. And 
coming and going, just as it is.
so we're um, wondering if you have any questions about your practice today. If you do, uh, you can click on, on the reactions button at the bottom of your screen there. There's a little raise hand button and we'll know you have a question. Yeah, anything that we might be able to support you with. Samantha, oh, hold on, let me let you unmute yourself here. Okay. Hello. Hi. Can you hear Samantha. me? Hi, Samantha. Hey. Thank you. I have a question about, I think is grace. Um, you talked about it a few weeks ago, Michelle, and also in many retreats. Um, when, um, when the experience gets really quiet, very slow and quiet, and can you hear me okay? Um, and I asked you this question before, both of them, but here it goes again. Um, how they come together. So you gave me an example of an accident you had, a colonial on the highway, and how fast things happen, and how present you were in the moment. Um, and as you're describing that, um, it seemed to me like there was grace delivered to you in that moment. Um, but for me personally, it's been um, that things that shift so fast, um, there are sudden that destabilizes. Um, and can be very painful, also come together soon enough with a holding and support and clarity that I don't know where it comes from. Um, and it's so fast that, you know, as soon as I look to see where it's coming from, it's gone. And it does come back again. It just seems um, so liberating, another word, to be able to experience both at the same time. And I know they are not at the same time, but it feels like that. And it feels like there isn't an inside or an outside, really. Um, but you did speak of that, so wondering if you can talk about it a little more. I just wanted to clarify one thing that you said that I wasn't, I couldn't hear that good, which is, um, are you describing the experience of things going fast and slow? as a kind of grace? The reaction to things going fast and slow, not being destabilizing as grace. Okay. Okay, so, um, are you aware of the, um, shift that allows for an underst like a wisdom, the wisdom or the understanding of that um, accepting, accepting how things are, accepting that fast and slow, for example, the acceptance of it will usually come from understanding that we don't mm -hmm. have control over it. Mm -hmm. So I would call that the understanding of that a kind of grace. 
Okay. Yeah. Got it. And it it isn't ours. Mm -hmm. So it's it is the a, a deep equanimity um, isn't ours. <laughs> Just like fear isn't ours, right? It'll come. It'll come from understand like from the mindfulness is so pure that that makes the equanimity pure and the equanimity is so pure then it'll make the mindfulness more pure and it'll it like it can just keep deepening and deepening before we pop out <laughs> before we pop out with a reaction right mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. great great so i would also call that purification that one can witness like that the the mindfulness is so pure which allows for the understanding and the wisdom and then the acceptance of the equanimity and then that keeps purifying each other there it's like there's a, a an exponential kind of wisdom that can happen if one can stay with that process I think I might just add, no, Samantha, we've, we talked about it a little bit recently, but um, just, I think there is something in your question that's intriguing to me around, like I have used, I kind of stopped using the word grace <laughs> in practice because I got feedback from a student once who's like a very precise English professor who when I, I I just used it in this kind of way that we are using it right where it um, where she was just like really you have to be careful with that word because it it so tends to be rooted in a kind of like religious context around like a divinity right that and it's kind of like what you also said like grace is kind of like bestowed on you by some other being or some power or something like that and so. And I was like, well, well, I just don't mean that. So, <laughs> uh, so just whatever. But uh, but I but it kind of bothered me enough in that I that I realized I wanted to be careful with what I was trying to convey in terms of this experience that is impersonal, right? Where where this acceptance, this equanimity, this quietude that you're describing, right? This deep peace and freedom arises. Mm -hmm. And to be very careful about all of the ways in which the mind is going to try to identify with it or have some, have it be identified with somebody or some being or somewhere, right? That this is this kind of like just profound tendency in us that is worth being careful of, right? So I don't mean to say that you shouldn't use the word or it shouldn't be used, mm -hmm. right? But I think it, for me, it did help me kind of want to be careful to describe exactly what Michelle is just saying, which is like, well, it's it's wisdom that al that arises, that allows for this relationship that's so quick, right? A, a relationship with you're saying you're you, you were brought together with unexpected negative event, right? Out of the blue. Mm -hmm. And that this ease arises spontaneously and naturally and so immediately right. is amazing. You know, that there is something so beautiful around that. And so there's the part that also gets that we're in that experience, there's no identification with it. It isn't like, oh, I am calm, or I have done this, or I've brought this. That's how powerful the wisdom is, is that it isn't even identified with. But then afterwards, this question of like, well, where did that come from? Who was right. responsible? For it? It's just like, just know that that's a reflection afterwards that's trying to kind of, it's trying to have your intellectual mind fathom what just happened in a way that the intellect can understand and there's just some place where that's never going to be the case the the, the thinking mind is never going to understand I don't know if I want to say that. <laughs> like, it's ever going to understand wisdom on that level. But to get that it's different, right? It's like a different mechanism in place. The thinking that's trying to kind of like lock it into a box, right? And this is like, and identify, this is what this is, versus the wisdom that doesn't need to do that with the truth, right? Um, 
so I just think it's like you're in a beautiful place. You have access to this beautiful qualities of mind. And can we do like this exploring that Michelle is kind of encouraging of like, well, you know, what are the qualities? What What is it that causes these sort of, you know, when, when you look at your practice and you mm-hmm. look at the last day, you look at the last five days, 10 days, 20 years, what are the conditions that allow for something like this to arise? What are the conditions just kind of momentarily in that? And that that's really the best, you know, we can do in terms of trying to analyze it. If you if you feel a need to analyze it, then it's through that like momentary understanding of what happened, what happened, what happened, what happened. And to not feel like we need to be able to have a conceptual framework over it. Because sometimes that will take us out of the space a little bit too, right? And then it's like, yeah, you'll find words to describe it. You'll find a way to sort of explain it. But if you have access to it, better to kind of hang out in it and just sort of explore it from the inside, you know? Good with me. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds great. Yeah, Michelle. Yeah. Um... Hmm. I'm going to say what I like about the word grace, um, because um, I really hear what this woman professor was trying to say, but I think a lot of language is like that. I'm not sure I would necessarily just pick on the word grace, you know what I mean, meaning that there's like, look at the word love. It's like much more complicated than the word grace, but it's like I see that for some people there is that connotation of something divine. and I don't think it's necessarily a word we might want to throw out, throw out entirely, which is not what I'm, I hear you saying. But I mm-hmm. wanted to comment on it just because I think that for some people, that insight, really, which is not what you're describing beautifully, Jesse, the insight that that this did not, that this wisdom did not come through the thought process, right? This is the whole point of Vipassana, really, is that you're you're letting go of that, figuring it out through the thought process, and that by that um, by that suspension of disbelief, that that requires. Um, uh, not necessarily an experiential faith, right? This is like all of us at the beginning of practice. We don't have that experiential faith necessarily, but but there is something deeper for all of us that can happen if you do suspend the disbelief and you do let go of that thought process uh, of figuring it out. And um, I think that takes enormous trust, which is why it's so hard like look at the conditions we have to create to have that Mm -hmm. protection enough to have that courage the courage enough to let go of that defense of the intellect and um Mm -hmm. so that when there is this (laughs) um sometimes it's called holy equanimity um i think that these words are complicated but there is a sense that it's so pure and i don't even like the word pure frankly i i don't i hear myself saying it and i'm like oh i wish i had a better word but that would take another you know the the ret- you know the session would be over and i'd still be going what could i say instead of pure so i don't but um with the limits of the language um I think that from what I understand about the word grace, it comes from uh, this felt, it's like a felt sense that you really can let go of control Mm -hmm. because actually you don't have it. So Mm -hmm. I think there's this like this confluence of things that happen in a few moments where you actually see it's like you actually get you don't have the control so why would you even bother Mm -hmm. right and that deep acceptance of how things are at that point for some people will feel like a kind of grace and I don't think that might be described by that as everybody and it could be um, 
you know, I had a Catholic conditioning, so maybe the word grace comes and something else might come for somebody else. Um, you can't, mm -hmm. what is it, throw the baby out with the bathwater? <laughs> I don't know, you know, the, the, con the Catholic conditioning can be pretty thick. So, um, but I do think that at least one renews one's understanding of the word <laughs> in that process. So I, I just feel like, um, I do agree with you, Jesse, that it's a complicated word to use, but I also feel like sometimes it gets across that feeling like you didn't make it happen. You just, nothing in you made this happen, and mm -hmm. right, yeah. um, that it isn't a divine power that made it happen either. Yeah, right, and I, I say, yeah. <laughs> that's You didn't tricky... make it happen, but it's still comma. Right. Like, and so right. that's the, like, that's, you have, as long as, like, your <laughs> grace, your notion of grace also has integrated in it this understanding that this, it is comma, it is based on past action, identified with or not, that right. then, then it's like, yeah, then it can, it can feel like totally resonant. And I think that's where the complexity, that's where the conundrum and the, the, the paradox of it is, you know, I think that we're both pointing to of like, this doesn't come out of nowhere and that's important to recognize and yet you didn't do it and so what does that mean right and it's that's why it's confusing and that's okay right and then and then that sense of like yes that you how fortunate you know that you have access to it or i mean this is a little tangential but since we're going back and forth in this this way there's i remember someone telling me a story of they went to have an interview with them i think it was sayada utejaniya you know and we we teach a very different approach you know than his but but still it was very it was there's something lovely about it where he was he was asking sayada like should i should i incline the mind toward nibbana and sayada said no you know the mind will get the object it deserves and there's something ouch. like, <laughs> ouch, that ouch, ouch, <laughs> I wouldn't say that. <laughs> but there's ouch. something to that, right? Of being like, don't try to control or manipulate or whatever. It's just like, whatever's next is whatever's next. And then the more you let go and the more you have faith in that and in that truth, the more you actually do drop into um, deeper wisdom perspective. Yeah. <laughs> Woohoo. Full of grace. That was great. Thank you both. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe you just have to have a connection to Mary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mary, man. You know, you gotta remember that one. <laughs> just joking. Okay. <laughs> Hi Rose. Hi Jesse. Hi Michelle. Hi everyone. Hi Rose. So um so maybe my mind is getting the object it deserves in my next question. <laughs> <laughs> Been watching my aversion this week. And like sometimes I just think, well, a lot of times I'm like, it's winning. And like what's bothering me about it is like, um, or why I feel like it hurts the most is because I feel like it's like trapped love and I could feel like the love under it. Like if it's like aversion towards a person or something like that. Right. And I feel like it's like cage love. And, um, and I feel like my wisdom is there at the same time as the aversion. And I feel like there's like a knowing there, like I know there's love here, right? And I also know there's a version and I'm doing this, which I feel like is against love. And so I'm sitting here bothered by that, like as if I get stuck there. Does that make sense? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. And it's heavy and it hurts. It's like cloaked love or something. Ah. Uh. I, I could start. Yeah. Sure. Ah, well, you see, metta, for example, is without conditions. 
And so it could be that um, the, there's wisdom, but there's also an inability to accept something unpleasant about the person. It could be, right? Like so that there, there's, it, it, we all have pleasurable, uh, unple unpleasant, and neutral aspects of ourselves. We all do. And so that to understand that love, <laughs> love when it's really love in terms of the metta practice will mean that there's an acceptance of the unpleasant aspect. It includes it. It includes it. So that rather than demonize the aversion, it could be that you're not accepting the aversion to this person, right? So it could be that you're not loving, you don't have enough metta for yourself, which would include accepting the aversion. I'm just fishing, I'm fishing. I, I think, I, I, like, yeah, I'm on to all of this, but part of me also just feels like I'm, I know, like I'm bashing myself, like, like I feel like aversion points to delusion. And therefore, if that's there, I have delusion. And so I'm hard on myself about that too. As if this is love and this aversion means like I'm not seeing clearly. Well, it could be that you're not seeing clearly that there's something unpleasant and you're not liking it. It could be that simple. But I also feel like my mind is like creating what I don't like because I feel like aversion is like a sneaky fox. And before I know it, like, am I really not liking something in that person or am I just tearing apart the universe? Because that's, I feel like what aversion kind of does. It, it, can, it can, it can, it can, we can hate everything pretty quickly after one little irritation. It can, it can, it can go from irritation to hearing it, hating everything in a few seconds. But I get that, like, I, I really he appreciate your language, Rose, around, like, <laughs> you're understanding that it it is the same. Like, it's a, to be aversive in one moment towards one person, that is the universe in that moment. And there is a way that it's tearing it apart. And that, yeah, I think just your appreciation of the implications of it, you know, and the... You know the the agony of it feels very honest and earnest. You know, and like earnest in your desire to be free from it. Just, it's powerful and it's really you know it's difficult. I mean, I I think the along this I think this question of like that you're even saying around like there's some kind of delusion there, which of course is true for all the time, right? If unless unless we're like totally free in any given moment delusion is operating on some level and i think kind of like what michelle is pointing to in terms of the question of what is it that we're not seeing is always interesting you know in terms of like you know some of the things she might have uh offered i i think there's also the sense of like what are we not seeing it because we're looking not quite in the exact right way so this sense of like there's love and it's imprisoned, or you use better language than that. Um, there's anger. You, you understand, you're seeing there's some kind of cycle happening. And I would say that like, that would be a place to look more closely, which is the, the, the notion that, that it feels like these things are all kind of happening at once and intertwined. But if you see them as more momentary, but of course, it's very fast, so it's hard to see that. That you might start to have a deeper understanding of what is going on in this relationship between love and hatred, right? Love and aversion, love and anger. And and my guess is that you're very close to your. It's like your the sense that you care about this person. I mean, of course, we don't know the details of exactly, but like you care about something, and there is a an honestness to that, a truth to that, but that that caring feels vulnerable in terms of uh, maybe the way it's been betrayed or that it doesn't feel like stable. And so the what you will often see in our own hearts is that aversion, anger, 
feels more stable in the moment. It feels stronger. It feels more um, protective. And so that will can emerge as like in the next moment as a kind of stronger defense. And part of what it's doing, it's, it's creating a stronger sense of me. It's creating a stronger sense of them. It's a, it's constructing a solidity to ourselves and to the world and to the, the situation. And that is a way that the heart is defending against the vulnerability of the situation, which is that it's unstable, it's unpredictable. And that to love in the context of unpredictability is very painful because it, because it isn't totally unconditional metta, doesn't have this perfect balance of, you know, wisdom, of course. And so that there's this way in which the love feels like not a safe place to build the connection with reality and that the aversion feels stronger, feels more stable. And yet it also feels toxic. It feels painful. You get that it's destructive. Um, And so then you kind of loop back around and that's sort of just like kind of it's like looking more and more closely at that over time and finding the places of like well where can you stabilize even for a few more moments with the love where can when you notice that you're care you also care about this person or you care about the situation or wherever you find it is there a place where you can kind of hang out just you just kind of hold on to it for a few moments right and try to feel like what is it like to sort of stay in that place and then see where does maybe the rug get pulled out what are those kind of tricks of the mind that that play in terms of rehashing a memory or rehashing a future concern or whatever um that get the mind back into the aversion as a stability and you just you you know, unfortunately, you kind of just, you have to kind of watch this play out more closely before there's a sense of the mind maybe not needing the aversion to find the sanctuary, right? That that actually the sanctuary in the care, the sanctuary in maybe it's more of the flavor of compassion, something like that. And in, yeah, the acceptance of, you know, the truth of things. I don't know. How does that sound? Really great answers. Super, super helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Because I I was just thinking about delusion in relationship with with what you said and what Josie said. And I think that um, on the level of like, if we don't allow ourselves to have a version, I don't think you can really find your way to love. Because love includes aversion. Like this is the whole point of unconditional is that it would be without conditions for for yourself. Like it's like to be able to deconstruct the moments of aversion would be de- finding the delusion in it. But in and of itself, like when we're irritated or annoyed or aversive with someone, I mean, usually it's that we can't allow, we want to, we're attached to the feeling of love and we don't, we don't want the aversion and then we reject the person. It's like this craziness, right? And you're seeing that. But if you look carefully, if you want to deconstruct it to the point of understanding delusion, then it's like, okay, like we're so funny. I mean, what do we get upset about with somebody like maybe... If you listen, maybe it was the sound of their voice once, right? Or like maybe it was the way they washed a dish. Or like if, it's like when you start to deconstruct what we're actually aversive about, then you just deconstruct what we call a person. Like who is it? Like it's like who am I? Who are you? They're just never ever changing moments, right? At the six cent doors, all of us are just this constantly transforming process of earth, air, fire, and water, thoughts, emotions. That's all we are. So what is it we don't like? Well, usually it's like some some behavior. And often if we're close to somebody, it's behavior that repeats, right? Like it's a behavior that start, starts to... Um, my mother used to do this thing when I was a kid with her m- mouth. Like it would be like, you know, and it w- became a habit. And she had gotten sick, but then it was just like, like the sound, like I would start, I would get so irritated with this sound. My mother was sick and dying and I would find myself outside like, "Ah!" I hope she won't like make that sound again, right? And it was like, wasn't about her, it was about me, right? And about being so caught in this identification and not seeing 
clearly how it was just unpleasant for me. But it wasn't her. That's the delusion, is when we think it's somebody that we're mad at. Personalizing it. Yeah. Over and over. And That's the, I would say that, if I would say anything about the cage, the cage is a very interesting metaphor, because like, how would you uncage it, you know? But I think the cage is the personal, personalizing of it, yeah. And, and that, that's true, the, and maybe this is obvious, but it's just to say, it's like that that's as true internally as it is about the other person. And I, and I think I would say that's, it's just another thing to explore. It's like, is it the aversion that's painful or the self, the selfing that's painful or both? But but I think that there's there's sometimes it's like we fight the aversion or we fight the greed or whatever it is, and we think that we need to like we need to heal this relationship with the object. But but there's another sense of like that actually what's hurting is just the selfing of the me. This this thing that you know has been in the last couple of weeks, especially Michelle has been kind of kind of coming back to of this you know nah. Uh, not me, not mine, not myself. Uh, just that sense of like, as a as a easy to remember kind of little reflection, right? Of of in these moments where we feel very caught up in certain tendencies and kind of tumults and turmoils around aversion or around craving, it's like where is it? Might we kind of look at this the process of self creation? Rather than the judgment around aversion, which can we can get there, it's like, oh, I shouldn't be aversive or I shouldn't be greedy. It's like, why not? Like, what is it like to sort of focus on something that maybe doesn't have as much like kind of moralistic uh, kind of judgment tone to it? And just being like, oh, where is it just that the way this is creating a sense of me is painful? And this is where is there a sense of this like, okay, not me, not mine, not myself, um, that can sometimes loosen that a little bit and give us an entry point that is, yeah, sometimes feels a little less loaded, right? Then, then, because when we're angry, like your anger and care are so connected, often we're angry about people we care, angry with people we care about. And so it's like a, our agenda with unhooking that can get in the way of just seeing clearly. And so maybe sometimes moving away from the aversion as a problem or the craving as a problem and just like the experience of selfness and selfing um, as like something you can just be interested in and watching as it happens, sometimes can kind of take a little bit of the voltage out of the exploration. Thank you so much. Definitely mm. getting the objects I need, I think. <laughs> <laughs> There we go. Hey, Catherine. Hi. Hi, Catherine. What was your question in all the answers was like literally everything I needed to hear. And, and yet I'm asking more, maybe because I just want to hear more about some of it. Um, I think I'm wanting to maybe ask more around like the aversion as protection against like if, let me slow down what I was gonna ask was before you asked your question Rose and all of that opened up was something around acknowledging that personally I'm like really at an edge that I'm like not usually at. Um, 
you know, usually have a lot of room for lots of stuff. And, um, and I'm finally like, just don't have a lot of room, you know, um, for people to wash a dish a certain way, like you said, Michelle. <laughs> um, and it's people I love. Yeah. And it's, and it's very painful to feel so, um, uh, irritated constantly because I don't have any space inside. And they, um, and my question was going to be, but it's not really the right question, but it's something around like, you know, I've been sick, I'm going to, and, and like everyone in my life is like, you know, we're worried about you. I want you to take care of yourself. Please take care of yourself. But as I try to take care of myself and ask for what I need, which may be some quiet time to myself or not to have to talk all the time or, you know, um, I feel like in trying to be kind to myself, I wind up risking, it's not that I'm not being kind to people, right? I'm not being cruel to them in any way, but asking for things that might inconvenience them or might be something they don't want or might mean, um, and so I, I, I was playing with like this dichotomy of kindness when I know it's not a dichotomy of like, that if I'm kind to myself, then other people, if I do what this body, my body needs and ask for it. Um, and then as you were talking, and then I'll stop because I'm now maybe going on too long that like, I think what I am actually, what came to me as you were talking is what I'm trying to do is have space and quiet so that I then can be open with in the moments, right? Like I can be intentional about, well, now let's have dinner together and I can be present and then I need to go away. Like I can't, I just can't, or I need, you know, these are little silly examples, bigger scale, but, um, but I find that that's hard for people. Anyways, I need to maybe let go of people understanding it, even though they're really well-intentioned, but I'm, I'm caught in kind of doubt and guilt and confusion a, a lot around kind of saying what I need and then being like, never mind, no, it's fine. I can just like hang and do the thing and make it work. And, and it's like, when am I going to get well? Like it's not going to happen. Um, so I, I don't know if there's a question there, but I think there's a big core of it that's around the, the sensitivity and the aversion. That's a big piece that I just, that feels so awful. And I keep trying. Yeah. Um, but it's giving me information about there's nothing there's no more gas in the tank in a way. Right. I'm trying to listen to that. So thanks. Yeah. I think it's super great. I don't know, Michelle, do you I oh, yeah, go ahead. First I have plenty I could yeah. say. So yeah. So it's so important, you know, I mean and, and I and I it's important like I think at the it's important and continues to be important because it's always changing. You know, like I think sometimes we have this fantasy of like a perfect balance, like the perfectly balanced life at which we have enough free time and we have enough social engagement and there's like, it's all like harmonized, you know, and not that that can't happen for periods and I, maybe it can happen longer <laughs> than that. But I think it's important to stay open to the sense of like, well, it's a constantly shifting dynamic in terms of how much space we need from interaction, how much space we need from interaction so that we can interact from more of our wholesome kind of qualities, you know, and, and then how do we navigate the relationship kind of expectations and stuff like that, that you're pointing out? How do we navigate that we are, we are ourselves have mixed motivations, you know, that we don't just want one or the other, that we want both, you know, um, that, that, that matrices of, of like things is very complicated, you know, as someone dedicated to the 
the path and the practice, you know, so it's just a, mostly a, to just say it's like a, an honoring of that dynamic and that tension and to, to recognize it as important and really difficult and fundamental, you know, just feels like a big deal. So, you know, given that and given that there's no maybe kind of perfect balance. I mean, it sounds like you're on it. You get that you, if you're always in it, you just, you lose, you lose access to the non kind of triggered, non irritated, more spacious qualities. And you know, some of the things that bring that into your life, which are whether it's sitting or time away or space, room to breathe, more silence, more nature, you know, it's like, I'm sure that's not like mysterious to you. The, the, the kind of, what are the list of things that kind of might be supportive and then how do you prioritize those as part of yourself how do you prioritize those in relationship that's hard i mean i think all anyone who's ever gone on retreat you know has understood that that's like hard for most people in our lives in this cultural context where this isn't understood or valued to a large degree you know people not understanding that like you're going somewhere and you're not going to be in touch you know and that for a lot of people in a lot of our lives it's like it just requires essentially training them the people in our lives to like get used to it you know and 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 a lot of it will come from or i mean some of it will come from hopefully people having a sense of like you're a better version of yourself when you have more of this time and space you know i remember you know just like the the this guy at one point you know coming on retreat and he was like having a really hard time and and at the same time he was like i he's like i and he his kids were like young and you know it was hard being away from them and at the same time he said you know it's like if my dad had been able to do this just take nine days off a year and just like go be quiet. It would have been really hard for our family, but it would have been much better. You know, he wouldn't have been just up against the wall all the time. And that really made it might've made like a big difference in like my childhood, you know, and like the version of him that I was having to deal with. So I think there is like a recognition that these are sometimes hard boundaries to make, but that there are, it's not just about like self care in a kind of nebulous way that there's this like something more existential and much more essential in terms of who we are and, and who we want to be in relationship and what comma are we creating with ourselves and with other people in our lives. And that we actually want to protect ourselves from that. And we want to protect them from that. And that that's a good wholesome thing. And just because they don't appreciate it or understand it doesn't mean we can't, we don't need to kind of like have the, determination to do that at times so this question of like where does the determin determination come from internally where are we willing to like you said risk you know disappointment um lack of understanding of course people may be feeling alienated there's there's always that you know challenge for sure um and that it is partly like a process of like can the relationship handle some degree of ex explanation, you know, and being like, listen, you might not understand this totally, but have a little faith that I do, you know, like I, I can be a better version if we don't talk about this right now, or I go into the other room and whatever. It doesn't have to be like going on retreat, right? It can be these like other things that boundaries to kind of like deal with the amount of voltage and, um, kind of just perpetual inundation of stimulus that is like hard to manage is something that you might actually, you know, will enrich a relationship as well. I think it's important. I don't know, Michelle will have more to say. I mean, I do, I, I always go, I have like the kind of like negative bodhisattva vow. And one of them is, you know, like beings are numberless. I vow to disappoint them all. Right. And like, can you, can you get into that? Like, can you, could you really, would you really, really to like disappoint everyone? Right. And like for the sake of liberation, sometimes it's like, a, it's important wall to come against, you know, in our own hearts. I don't know, Michelle.
I think it's more, I would maybe add in a little bit more support of what Jesse's saying. I think that um, sometimes it's hard to accept oneself if there's been a lot of chronic pain you know, or the circumstances of pain. When the more pain there is, whether it's physical, emotional, or mental, and that that can be chunks of times in our lives or years, um, a lot of the energy is going into healing that. And so, um, there isn't as much bandwidth, <laughs> and. Um, you know, I, I've had a couple of rough years, but this last few months have been incredibly difficult and a lot of responsibility and pressure and um, body not well. And so I see that um, I'm attached to the version of myself that I am not right now. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, I like that person that, I was when I didn't have all this pain and pressure, but I can see that it's very clear to me, especially if I'm driving, like driving is the indicator. Like if somebody, you know, does something obnoxious with their car, I don't have the bandwidth I might have had, you know, the patient, that's patience, right? Or in the grocery store, I can see that um, I'm glad that we can't read each other's minds, right? Like, you know, I'm glad that nobody can hear, like, my reaction because it's so, um, it's not the person I'm, I'm used to being, but I also have a lot of understanding that the energy is, um, there's no gas in the tank, right? That's what you said. So I'm just kind of offering that, that it takes, um, it's actually getting to see that other people will be attached to the version a view that you're attached to. So it's a slippery slope, right? That, 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 that you're clearly getting almost like you're begging for space, right? You're, I can see it in you. You're begging for space. And you would hope that people would understand. And if they don't, you know... You do. And I, it's not yeah. like, yeah. And this is like also additional family. It's not like my primary. Right, but, right. But, but yeah. They do. And I think it, it does mean that they don't necessarily get what they, you know, there is some disappointment and loss in it. And I think, but I, I think what you're also saying about my attachment to who I am and other people, it feels really, because I was like, I was dealing with this stress for like, I was like, I am doing it. I am like, I am here. I'm present. I'm grounded. Craziness. Here I am. I can show. And then it was just like, oh, I'm gone. I'm done. I'm toast. <laughs> like, I'm gone. And it's like, where'd she go? Like, it's just, yeah. And so I think that's probably some of what this is, is, is like, it's an avalanche. It, it, it was like so fast. Yeah, no, but it is like, you know how an avalanche happens all at once? But there were a lot of conditions to the point where the avalanche happened. That's what happens. It's like there's no more, there's nothing more to give. Yeah, it's interesting. And I feel like it's a great exploration, really. I mean, if you're interested in identification and attachment to pleasant and all this stuff and it's like uh, attachment to energy having energy all of it is a great exploration but it's not what you'd call popular <laughs> it's not it's not a popular place to be even with yourself it's like yourself isn't popular but it's also um i think the thing that jesse said that's so important is that uh, of many things he said was important but it's like that sense that <sighs> There is no one that is going to give you that space but you. And there's nothing that will heal this but getting the space, right? Like you, and, so, and you know that so deeply. So it, I think there is something about all of this for all of us when we get to have um, times like this in our lives that um, it, if you don't carve it out and it'll feel more like carving than just taking, if you don't carve it, um, you're going to get worse. 
And there can be a loneliness in that. There's a loneliness in when karma can be that intense. There, there can be, but it doesn't have to be um, if you accept that this is just karma unfolding and um, this is what it's going to take to um, not only get through it, but to, to get liberated with it. I, and I think I do want to just add, sorry, of like, huh. there are going to be times in life where you can't get space. I mean, you know, you're fortunate right now if it's like a matter of just like the relationship and the complexities of that versus like there's a war happening outside, right? Like there might be like plenty of human conditions can arise where it's like there is no space. There is just war. And and in that context, it's like to know that there's still a relevant thing in terms of like something that might feel more mundane, which is like if you want to try to get free in the context of that, it means like an incredible determination, right? It means that you have to dig in and be like, every time someone is doing the dishes or doing the irritating thing, that you are like digging in to like, I like Metta, like the Brahma Viharas or, or whatever, like, you know, the carefulness with our actions, carefulness with speech. There's a sense of like, you have to treat it as if that like you're not going to just have natural as access to the spaciousness right and that therefore there's like a vigilance and determination with the mind and with a responsibility around our actions that like you can manifest right and so there is that sense of like also knowing that when conditions are imperfect and you cannot get the space you want it doesn't mean that it's just hopeless it means that you need to kind of like dig in to your responsibility around it and and that that is tiring and that is taxing and it has its own degree of um beauty right of like what is it like to try to really commit to these ethical conduct principles in the midst of like difficult circumstances that it's doable and it's possible but it's also it requires a a little bit of fire you know um and or a lot of fire, you know, depending on the conditions and, and that that's also worthy. It's a worthy, like, way to practice, you know, in our lives. I yeah. can offer, yeah, I'll offer one more thing that I think, um, I've never talked about this in public, but it, I think it's important and that I think a lot of people who are drawn to, like, a deep liberation um, might have to look at and so I did a um, three-month retreat in 1984 and um, it was with Sayada Upandita. And it was very intense, a very intense three months and a lot of um, very uh, painful memories came up from my childhood that I hadn't remembered. Um, and that was a time on the planet, 84, where trauma was not um, dealt with yet. Uh, at all, hardly. And um, so, um, I don't know where to go with this next part of the story, but I almost want to jump uh, how many months? Hmm. Probably a year of trying to find some help and not getting it and kind of feeling like I was underwater. And somebody suggested that I go to Switzerland to work with a, a, a sand play therapist, Dora Kolf. Uh, I was in Hawaii at the time, but I'd never left the country before. And uh, once I did, yeah, I did a retreat in England, but I, had, I was in such a vulnerable place, I can't even tell you. And going to Switzerland in the state I was in did not feel like a good idea, but I was desperate. So I went, and then the sand play therapist, Dora Kolf, who founded sand play, um, had said she would see me, and then she said she didn't have room. So I was <laughs> at some yogi's uh, apartment, and um, wow, you know, she didn't have room, and I was really, felt stranded there, and very, uh, not in good shape. But she invited me eventually to um, train with her, like go to trainings, but I hadn't even done it yet. 
And so that was all very weird. But finally she made space. And uh, I used to have to take the train to uh, see her. So I remember it was a big deal that I was finally, I was thinking, oh, I'm, I'm going to get some help, you know. <laughs> oh, boy. Like, and I went in and I did my little sand play and she uh, she was very quiet for a long time and she looked looked at it, looked at me and said, um, I'm not sure I'll be able to say it. It was so powerful. She said, uh, hardly anyone you know or will ever know will understand how deep you have to go to heal. And it was so helpful. Like, that was so helpful because I had always had been getting the feedback in my life that I, or, you know, I should be whatever, whatever, I shouldn't be like I am because I should, whatever it is, <laughs> too sensitive or too this or too that. But it was like, wow, that's all I, that's all I needed to keep going. Like, for years, it was just like, oh, oh, oh. Um, I, I am going to feel misunderstood. And that's just how it is. They're not going to understand. That's what I have to do to heal. And it was like, I'm, I'm offering that, Catherine, because I think it's important to, sh to say that for you. And particularly family. <laughs> We get these families that really don't tend to get it. You know, some do. Some people are very fortunate and uh, have that. But um, usually you're supposed to at least kind of feel part of the family in a way that uh, if you're kind of drawn again to deep liberation, a lot of people don't under, like Jesse was saying it, I'm saying it from a different angle. They don't understand what it's taking uh, to, to want to be free on that level. And it actually takes, it takes a lot of energy. Some people think they can have it all. I think nowadays there's this idea, this impression you can have it all and still get fully liberated. And I just don't think that's true. I, I, I don't think it's true at all. It's nice wishful thinking. <laughs> anyway, that's... Good luck, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Take care of yourselves. See you next week. Mm-hmm. <laughs>